This is your source for breaking news and what to make of it all. This is the Mike Gallagher Show. And so I'm proud that President Trump likes me. Today, the U.S. has the highest economic growth rate leading the world economies since the pandemic. The highest in the world. I can tell you what Bidenomics is, Martha. It is everybody pays more for basic staples of life. People are paying way more for groceries. And now, sitting in for Mike today in the ReliefFactor.com studio. All right, welcome back Carl to Jackson. the Mike Gallagher Show. Again, sitting in, uh, coming to you live from the ReliefFactor.com studio. Uh, joining me now on the program is Jordan Seculo of the American Center for Law and Justice. Uh, Jordan, welcome to the Mike Gallagher Show. I appreciate your time, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Jordan, let me just say this. Let me say this real quick before we get started. I be, I was I was a heathen before yeah, before I was saved. I was a heathen and I used to work literally three jobs. I worked as a janitor and one of the people that I used to listen to was your dad, Jay Seculo, because I would drive at different times. He would be on. I would flip to him and Limbaugh. I was a liberal at the time, had no idea who these guys were, but I would listen to them during my drive time because I just wanted to hear something, and I had good reception. And then later when I got saved, I was like, why don't Christians know about the fights that are happening in the courts? So that's my little story, if you will, when it comes to your dad and and the legacy, the legacy that he's instilled in me because right away when god saved me i got involved in politics and i didn't care a lick about them so anyway i just wanted to share that with you Uh, jordan thank you man um and i appreciate what you guys do i didn't think this would happen i am so happy over this decision of the supreme court rejecting uh, uh affirmative action talk to us about the case if you would yeah, I think it's the the right decision, and I think where where the the court is very fair, and you're not going to hear this from the left. What they said is that in these two scenarios, where you look at UNC and Harvard, which were the two schools challenged here, they used they used race as a deciding point at the very end of the application process. So you'd get, so if you were kind of making it towards the end, mm-hmm. in Harvard's case, it was one of four kind of pluses or minuses depending on what race you were. And then in the UNC case, it could literally be the decisive reason why someone does or doesn't get in. And what the court says, race can't be used as a negative. And it's a negative even if you're letting someone else in because of their race, it's a negative to someone else. And here, I think where it finally opened the minds of the court is that uh, they've always said with affirmative action, even in the last case, uh, which was back in 2006, that at one point, this needs to come to an end. We're only okaying this for now because... Uh, There have been issues of discrimination in the past that need to be addressed. That's what these schools are doing. But eventually, this is not going to survive constitutional muster. And once these Asian students finally challenged Mm -hmm. and said, hey, we are a minority, but being part of our minority, uh, because we happen to be doing well academically, is used as as a strike against us in these universities. And so the court woke up and said, you know what, this is a total violation of the Equal Protection Clause. It doesn't survive the strict scrutiny of the Constitution. And so, in in fact, this does away with the broad-based kind of just affirmative action based off, you get a plus, you're in if you're you're this race, you're not if if you're the other race. You know, one of the reasons why I think this is a good thing, Jordan, is because, in my opinion, it ends what the left would always call institutional racism. I think this is a form or was used as a form of institutional racism. Uh, You know, uh, you would get in based upon your race and not based upon merit. But other people, just as you mentioned, like the Asians that brought the case, they, they would be denied. Whites that would be denied. And people, honestly, that should have jobs or not have jobs as a result of being accepted into certain colleges and universities. Yeah, and I think what, what is cool about this decision, and for everybody listening, is that they, they didn't say that, like, for an individual, if you wrote your essay, depending on what the essay was on, but let's say they asked you to write about, you know, your personal experience in your e- education or growing up. Tell us about, you know, your background. Of course, someone reading that is going to take into account uh, if you had, if you had uh, barriers that you overcame. That's actually the word used in the in the in the decision. So it's not that your background is not going to be important in the admissions process. It's that you're not going to get this generic plus or minus just because you happen to be black or happen to be white or happen to be Asian. 
that if it's part of this larger story that you have put together in your application, of course that can be considered as your as the overall person that is applying. And that, the, that, of course, schools have an interest in diversity as well, but they can't just have these policies like, like you're talking about where you just get in because uh, and you beat the other student out solely because of the color of your skin. Do you think that this will do much for true diversity on uh, college campuses? And when I say diversity, I mean diversity of thought. That's the uphill battle, right? It's, it's, it's kids being indoctrinated, and then at a certain point, uh, these professors who, I mean, I remember when I went to college and kind of the, the, the saying was, you know, these professors are usually kind of wacky and kind of out there and that's kind of normal. And you kind of go through the process as a college student and then you've got to go to the real world and you wake up in the real world. And, and a lot of that stuff just kind of goes out the window and you start being a lot more realistic. You have a family, you get a little bit more conservative. You have kids, you start paying taxes, things like that. Now it's so much more indoctrination. That, and I think that's part of this, like, the woke culture thing is that right. it's part of corporate America now. It's part of getting that job out of college. You've got to walk all of those lines. I mean, I think about how my kids and think about, like, all the words they're going to have to learn to say or not say if they do want to go in the corporate <laughs> world. And, and that, so that's not just – it used to be limited kind of to the college campus. That was kind of the, the place for all the, the weird thoughts to go out. But now it's 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 impacted your next job, your job out of college. I think that's what's more much more difficult is the corporate world. Yeah, and I mean just the fact that they're able to discriminate. A lot of these places discriminate uh, against people based upon race was absolutely uh, insane to me. I think this does say Eric and I were talking about it during the break. This says th this is part of Trump's legacy. You know, I gotta gotta give him credit with uh, with yep. these judges. Uh, the reversal of Roe v. Wade. Now now this. Um, I'm one that I believe Jordan that we should go on the offense on these particular issues. A lot of conservatives are a little scared to do that. Uh, how should conservatives explain this? Yeah, I think you explained it very simply. Is that your, your child is not going to be denied admissions because of the color of their skin. It, it, yeah. that, that Again, their life story can be important to the admissions process. So it doesn't mean that you have to ignore completely where how you were brought up, what neighborhood you grew up in, what your life was like, uh, what you overcame. I mean, they use that language here. So you're not having to ignore those factors. What we're saying in our country is that we're not going to uh, 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 allow a university to deny admission to a student because they're Asian. I mean, I, I tell, I, I, so that's how I explain it to people. Or deny admission to a student because they're black. Or deny admission to a student because they're white. I mean, all of see, what happened with affirmative action, and this is what the court acknowledged 20 years ago, was that ultimately this is going to get out of whack and we're just going to have to do away with affirmative action because it's going to be, uh, it's, it, the issue will be handled, d diversity will be there, the d discrimination uh, will actually become reverse discrimination, and that's what happened here. Is it is that uh, again? It was a it was something that the court believed was necessary for a period of time to right some wrongs in the in the admissions process, college admissions process, and that was it. And today they said we're done. All right. Well, Jordan, listen, uh, I I appreciate you joining us today. We only have about thirty seconds left. Where can people go to find you and hear uh, learn more about this? Because I know you guys will be uh, talking about it today. Yeah, we will. So we'll be on the Seculo broadcast. That's at aclj uh, dot org. We're on the Salem uh, uh, network as well. Uh, and so, and again, we filed it in this case, so people can read our. We'll have a blog up in our brief as well at aclj dot org. They can find out more about us there. Jordan Seculo of the American Center of Law and Justice. Thank you so much. Thanks for the work you guys do too, man. I really do appreciate it. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you.